This lecture will cover safety in the clinical microbiology laboratory. Um, so I'm not going to go really too far in detail with this lecture because we did cover safety a lot within our intro course as well as some of our other courses. Um, so I'm just going to mostly just kind of point out a few things that are more um, specific to micro in general. So working in microbiology, it's very important to understand the various routes of um, infection or how an infection can take place. Because you're working with and handling um, specimens every day that could potentially have some sort of pathogenic microorganism attached to that specimen. And so you've got to be aware of how to handle it so that you're not creating any sort of potential route of transmission to yourself. Now we do know that a lot of things are airborne, um, so you want to avoid creating any, any sort of aerosols. Um, so making sure that you're uh, centrifuging things with caps on it. If something breaks in a centrifuge, making sure you know the proper protocol for allowing that centrifuge to sit for so many minutes to allow those aerosols to disperse and, and to settle down so that you're not opening that up and, and spraying those aerosols throughout the room or that you're in. Um, we know that we can ingest the microorganisms, so making sure that you wash your hands before you leave the lab, before you eat, not eating and drinking in the lab, not applying cosmetics, not putting things in your mouth, that pen chewing and pencil chewing, that needs to stop now. Do not put things in your mouth. It's just a good general practice um, to not put things in your mouth that could potentially have something on it that can make you sick. There can be a direct inoculation, so you can get the infection directly from a needle stick or broken glass or scratch on your hand. So if you have open wounds, making sure you cover those and protect those and wearing those gloves to prevent any sort of exposure. You can have exposure through mucous membranes, um, so making sure that you're not um, you know, touching your face and your eyes with gloved hands or you know, hands that haven't been washed because you can um, potentially get an infection in your eye just from something that you may have on your hands. You can also get um, a vector bite that could cause an infection. Now you're not going to be exposed to this as much in the lab, um, but just know that you know if there are organisms or vectors that come into the lab, for example a flea or mosquito, uh, you know they could potentially um, you know, land on your plates or flies, things like that. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of labs don't allow plants and stuff like that in the lab or, you know, making sure you clean out your trash and empty the biological uh, waste material because it can attract insects and, you know, those insects are going to be on that material that could have a potential, um, potentially a potential pathogen that, you know, could, they could take somewhere else. So, um, there, there are a variety of ways that these infections can take place. So we have to be aware of what they are in order to do our job and um, just protect ourselves not only in everyday life, but in our work environment as well. Now, as we've learned, there are a lot of regulatory agencies that have a part in the lab. But as far as safety goes, it's going to kind of boil down pretty much to OSHA, the CDC, um, College of American Pathologists, Joint Commission, and of course there are other um, other agencies that you know have a safety component to it as well just like CLIA is going to have some safety components to it there are a lot of organizations but basically you're going to kind of be answering to some of these various organizations and when they come in and to inspect you especially like Joint Commission or your lab inspectors they're going to be looking at these safety practices and making sure that everyone is following the safety practice that um, the employees have all of the tools that they need, all of the personal protective equipment that they need in order to do their job and be safe at it. So OSHA does require that every laboratory facility have some sort of laboratory safety officer who will oversee the development and implementation of a safety program, um, as well as doing new lab employee orientation, preparing the lab safety manual, as well as developing and implementing any sort of exposure plan. Now your exposure control plan um, has to kind of spell out various things, and it's going to include things like the training processes and safety education, 
the plan to investigate any sort of incidents when it takes place and follow up with that to make sure that you prevent any sort of future reoccurrence. It's going to list the methods of compliance for standard precautions. It's going to list any sort of engineering controls that will be used, as well as the personal protective equipment. It's going to list handling and disposal of hazardous waste for your laboratory. It's also going to have a post-exposure procedure, and so this is going to kind of outline if you do have a needle stick or you do have um, some sort of exposure in the laboratory. Um, let's just say that you dropped a tube and it splashed up in your face. There will be a protocol that spells out exactly what steps that you need to do to get treatment, to report the exposure, who to call, where to go, whether or not you should go to the emergency room. Um, so all of that's going to be laid out, and then it's also going to list what kind of follow-up procedures will take place. In other words, if um, you need additional testing, if you need um, to test the source patient as well as as you and then doing follow-up testing so many months after that just to make sure that you did not um, have any sort of exposure. It may also include things like the prophylactics that will be given um, based off of the particular exposure. Um, it will also list any sort of guidelines for you as far as what you will use to maintain a clean and sanitary workplace, what what you'll use to actually clean your workbench. So all of this is going to be laid out in that exposure control plan. A part of that safety officer's job is that safety education. So they're going to make sure that they're doing orientation um, with all new employees and they're going to document any sort of professional development. Um, they're going to make sure that safety manual is in place and that all those policies are up to date. They're going to review those. They're going to make sure that staff reviews them. If there's any changes, they're going to um, make those revisions and they're going to make sure that everyone who's responsible for um, working in the lab is going to read those policies. Anyone who was going to be affected by those policies will be required to review it. And so um, the safety officer is going to make sure that that's done. Safety officer is also going to make sure that there's some sort of bioterrorism response plan in place um, so that if there is any sort of biological threat, um, you'll know how to handle that and what to do. So your universal and standard precautions. So with your universal precautions, this is going to reduce the risk of actually transferring something like HIV, Hep B, or any other bloodborne pathogen in a healthcare setting. And so human blood and body fluids that contain visible blood, um, including semen, vaginal secretions, tissue, body fluids, all of those are going to be disposed of um, in a particular way. So um, the universal caution, ca universal precautions that you will use will be basically to assume that anything that you're dealing with it's going to, it has the potential to infect you with something like a HIV or a hepatitis. Um, your standard precautions are what you're going to use to just protect yourself. Um, some sort of preventive measure that will be applied to all patients to reduce the risk of infection. So you're basically, again, going to treat all patients as though they're infectious. So when you in contact with patients, you're going to use your gloves and you're going to um, use your safety devices for um, anything that you're collecting. So you're, you're basically going to protect yourself um, from being exposed to anything. So using those universal precautions and those standard precautions are going to help protect you from any potential exposure. Now you do need to make sure that you follow those safety guidelines, so no food and drink in the lab, um, wearing your protective equipment for whatever job that you're doing. You do have to be aware of the job that you're doing and the potential for exposure. So if you're doing something where you could potentially be splashed in the face, then of course wearing that protective eyewear, um, any sort of face shield, using any of your uh, shields that may be on your counters to help avoid any sort of splash. Uh, making sure you wear your lab coat, not wearing any sort of open toe shoes or shoes in which anything can fall down into it. Um, Crocs, for example, that have all the holes in it, they're not good lab shoes.
uh, washing your hands, disinfecting your work area, don't mouth pipette, make sure your eye wash stations are working as well as your, your emergency showers, making sure that they're working, making sure you do the maintenance on those. Um, if you're in a, in a particular part of the lab where you may need a respirator, making sure you get properly fit. Um, making sure you properly dispose of things. If it's a sharps, making sure it's in that puncture-resistant container. Making sure everything has your biohazard labels on it. So these are all things that you need to do to make sure um, you prevent yourself as well as your coworkers from being exposed. And of course, some of the personal protective equipment that you're going to use is just your standard general things like your um, your gloves, your face shield or mask. If you're working in micro, a lot of times you'll be working up under the hood. So that's going to kind of act as that face shield. Um, any sort of um, gown or protective covering, depending on the environment that you're in, like some molecular departments, you have to do the hairnet and you pretty much cover up top to bottom your shoes, you put shoe covers on. So anything that you might need based off of your particular work environment. Um, you may need a respirator. You could potentially need vaccinations to do your job. Um, so there are some hepatitis vaccines out there that are available to help protect you from potential exposures. Now there are various engineering controls that are out there, just various um, safety features on analyzers and centrifuges and things like that. Um, like your centrifuges, they won't allow you to open them while they're expanding, at least some of the newer ones now. If you do have a really, really old centrifuge in your lab, it is possible that you can open it while it's still spinning, but these are really, really old centrifuges. Um, your biological safety cabinet is what you're going to be using in micro that is one of your big main engineering controls. And so the biological safety cabinet um, that you use for your particular lab is going to be based off of what you're actually working with in your lab. So most labs require a biosafety level two. Um, and so the particular cabinet that is used in that should be a class 2A. Um, depending on what lab you're working in, what type of specimens you could potentially get in to that laboratory will depend on what biosafety level of the lab that you are um, in as well as the particular biosafety cabinet that you would actually purchase for use in that laboratory. Um, so if you are, you know, working just general uh, hospital laboratory microbiology, um, not really expecting to be exposed to any sort of biological weapon, then you're probably going to be working in a level two with a class 2A um, biological safety cabinet. However, if you're maybe working for the CDC or um, some sort of research laboratory or a really large reference laboratory, um, especially like CDC where you could potentially be getting in or a state lab, for example, where you could be getting in those bio or bio, potential bio weapons. Um, let's just say, for example, anthrax. So if um, a lab has a culture and it looks suspect for anthrax and they send it off to be identified, then they're going to send it to these higher level labs that can handle opening up that plate um, in that biological safety cabinet. So um, you will have some exercises that you will do to learn a little bit more about what a biological safety cabinet is, but that just kind of gives you a little bit of a brief synopsis of what you will expect. Now, of course, one of the main things that we're going to try to do is we're going to try to prevent this potential hazardous material from, um, you know, leaking out or potentially infecting whoever's transporting it or whoever's working in the lab. So we've got a lot of things that are kind of in place to prevent that exposure. But we also, once we've made our culture and it's time to dispose of whatever that is, then we need to make sure that we dispose of it properly. Um, so any of that hazardous material, it has to be properly labeled, it has to be properly disposed of. If it needs to be go through a decontamination step, you need to make sure that that's done according to procedure because 
as we'll learn, certain organisms, um, based off of their makeup, certain things can kill them and certain things can't kill them. So making sure that you dispose of whatever source it is based off of what it could potentially have in it is is very important. Um, and also, you know, things like the bags. If you've ever worked in a laboratory and you've gotten a bag in um, where the urine top wasn't on good and that whole urine spilt out in that bag, um, you know that that's, that's a good way that we find out whether or not those bags are really leak proof. Um, sometimes you might double bag a specimen depending on what it is. So a lot of labs will require that urine specimens are double bagged simply because patients or nurses or whoever's collecting that may not always sit that lid on there properly and so it could leak out. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind um, that when you're dealing with specimens you got to know what your specimen is. You got to know what could potentially be hazardous with that specimen so that you know how to properly handle it, label it, and dispose of it. Now if there is an exposure your facility should have a post exposure plan. Um, it's going to list the documentation that has to take place, what sort of emergency treatment should be seeked, um, what sort of test or follow-up should be done, if there's any sort of testing that needs to be done to check the status of the source, um, as well as the person that had the exposure, um, possibly following up with some sort of immunization, a prophylactic treatment, um, serology testing, and then follow up on down the road. Um, to make sure, you know, doing those serological tests to see if they've developed any sort of um, disease post-exposure months down the road, so something like HIV. Um, doing follow-up and corrective and preventative actions, so this will be all part of that documentation to make sure that you do have a plan in place to prevent any sort of incident from happening again. Now in microbiology, there are some terms that you should be familiar with um, as far as it relates to controlling microbial growth. So sterilization, this is actual physical or chemical process that will kill the microorganisms, including the endospores. So like I mentioned, you do have some organisms that are a little bit harder to kill than others. Um, one example is an organism that has those endospores there. They're a little bit harder to, harder to target. So sterilization process would be needed for these. A disinfectant, so this will actually destroy most of the microbes, but it doesn't kill the spores. Biocides, these are chemical agents that will inactivate a microorganism. So it can have a bacteriostatic property or a bactericidal property. You also have liquid decontaminants, so 10% bleach solution. Um, this is a lot of what we clean a lot of our countertops and things with in the lab is that 10% bleach solution. You may also have a procedure that calls for you to do a 70% ethanol decontamination. Um, your, your HEPA filters, um, these are going to help try to clear out some of those air contaminants that could potentially come into a room and get on your um, plates when you're looking at or opening up your plates to do your cultures and things like that. So um, those are more or less going to be in your, um, it could be potentially in your overall air system, but they're going to more or less stay within that biological safety cabinet to prevent anything from contaminating um, that airflow within that cabinet. Now again, where I mentioned earlier, you've got to know the source of your sample. Um, you've got to know what potential organisms could be there because you've got to know how to properly dispose of it, how to di disinfect your work area and things like that. So making sure that you select the appropriate disinfectant for the particular task that you're doing. Um, so you need to know, be aware of the surface or the material that you are disinfecting. Um, you need to know if there's any sort of presence of any sort of organic material. Uh, you need to know the timing of it. You know, some, if you've been familiar with some of the, the wipes that come in the little containers that are used in the med medical environment that they use to wipe down the tables, some of those say that the surface has to be wet for so many minutes. So if the surface has to be wet for three minutes, 
you've got to continuously be wiping down that surface for three minutes. Just wiping it down one time and letting it air dry for 10 seconds is not going to properly disinfect. So you've got to know what your solution is and if it says that it needs to remain wet for X amount of minutes. You've got to know the particular organism that could be on that surface um, or within that sample. You've got to know, um, so for example, if the particular sample that you're testing, if you know that you're testing it because you're looking for a biological threat, then you need to know that, you know, you're looking to kill something that could potentially have a spore. So you've got to know how to disinfect that particular area or sample. Um, you've got to be aware of how much microbe could potentially be present. Um, you've got to know the concentration of the disinfectant that you're making. So for example, if you're using a 10% bleach solution, you've got to know how to mix that in order to get that 10% concentration. Um, you've got to be aware of the temperature and pH um, of, of various environments. Uh, so some organisms can't live in certain temperatures and some organisms can't live in certain pHs. So you've got to be aware of the particular source. Um, you know, is it a temperature in which a, a particular organism could grow in but not another? So you've got to know that particular organism and how you're going to treat it. So there are a lot of the factors involved that's going to take place of how you're deciding what particular disinfectant you're going to use. Um, so just kind of be sure that you're familiar with what you're trying to disinfect and be familiar with that um, policy that is put into place in your lab because your safety officer is already going to be, will have already um, looked at what potential exposures are going to take place. So they're already going to address how you're going to decontaminate or disinfect. Fire safety, of course, you're not going to be exposed to as many fire hazards as it was years ago, but you are working with some chemicals. Those chemicals can potentially ignite um, as far as within micro. But most labs aren't using Bunsen burners anymore, so you don't really have that. that um, that potential exposure, most of what you're going to have will be your um, the chemicals and stains and things that you use that would be potentially flammable, as well as your combustible type waste, your paper waste. Um, so not a lot of fire safety, fire safety hazards other than, you know, your equipment getting too hot, anything that you may have as far as a heat element. There are some testing that may require you to use some sort of hot plate. Um, so there are potentials there. Of course, you could have, you know, an instrument malfunction, some sort of electrical spark. Um, so that's why it's important to keep those flammables in the safety cabinets um, and those flame resistant cabinets, making sure stuff's properly labeled. Um, if you're putting a chemical into another container, making sure that that container is properly labeled, that everything's stored properly and that you have um, a working fire extinguisher that's available to you. There are a few chemicals that you will work with and be exposed to within the microbiology lab. Um, again, you're gonna refer to those safety data sheets, um, what we now refer to as material safety data sheets. Um, those sheets are gonna outline everything that you're gonna need to know about those that chemical. Um, Working in micro, most of what you're going to be exposed to is just going to be the chemicals within your kit testing or your various um, analyzers, your micro plates, um, your stains, things like that. And so all of these are going to have some sort of safety data sheet that's going to tell you what your exposure is. And they should all list the permissible exposure limit as well as a short-term short exposure limit. Um, so what's permissible legally for an employee to be exposed to versus um, the short-term exposure limit. So how long you can be exposed to it before it actually starts causing a problem. Um, so again, you're not going to...
not a lot of hazardous chemicals you will be exposed to a micro, but there may be a few, and a lot of it will depend on what particular testing is done at your site.